communist power moving in a red tide across the world. Communist power reducing man to a slave of the state. Communist power sweeping everything before him, destroying the old, enthroning the new creed of atheistic materialism. What is this ideology enclosed in steel? What explains its amazing driving power? Who are the prophets of this new religion? Insight. An exploration in depth of the spiritual conflicts of the 20th century. Insight. How do you do? I'm Father Kaiser. The fact of communist power is beyond dispute. The Red Empire extends from the Berlin Wall to the Pacific Ocean, from the Arctic Circle to the Himalayan Mountains. It embraces more than 800 million people. Here in America, we recognize the extent of communist power, and we are no longer naive about its evil intent. It threatens our freedom. It seeks to dominate the world. And this is why we have resolved to resist this power in every feasible way and at whatever necessary cost. Our approach to this conflict must be an intelligent, positive one. We must understand our enemy. We must understand what he's trying to accomplish. Today, we're going to enter the lives of three men who have done more than any others to make communism what it is. Our guests are Karl Marx, Nikolai Lenin, and Joseph Stalin. These men have promised to hide nothing from you, to speak frankly from the depths of their own convictions. In fact, they seem quite confident they can persuade you to their views. We meet first Karl Marx, the communist theorist. I want to thank you for granting me this interview. No, oh, on the contrary. I've got to thank you. Please make yourself comfortable. Thank you. You know, uh, the press has always been most useful to me for disseminating my ideas. <laughs> now, what is it you'd like to know? Well, first of all, would you mind telling me why you wrote the uh, Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital? <laughs> it's very simple, my friend. History gave me a mission. I am to free the proletariat from centuries of oppression. I am to draw up the blueprint for a, uh, shall we say, uh, a heaven on earth. <laughs> you look surprised. Well, I am. I never thought of your philosophy as embracing any heaven. <laughs> I don't mean in the Christian sense, my friend. Not at all. A heaven on earth in which each man would give according to his abilities and to receive according to his needs. Then you think man is capable of uh, perfectibility on this earth and of building such a world? I do, if he is re-educated. How? He must be stripped of all his illusions. Such as? Oh, there are so many of them. I tell you, the worst is his belief in God. Oh, then uh, you're an atheist. Yes, I am. Look, I cannot see God. I cannot feel God. So why should I believe in him? Well, the vast majority of the human race does believe in God. Ah, not in God. In their fear of oblivion. They create a God in their own image and likeness in order to console themselves. <laughs> Religion is the opiate of the people. In what way, uh, opiate? Well, it alienates man from himself. It distorts his thinking. It, it saps <laughs> his vital energies. An interesting theory. That's not a theory. That is a fact. What led you to this conclusion? My father. You see, he came from a family of rabbis, and he turned his back on his Jewish heritage. And he didn't have the courage to go all the way as I do. Instead, he merely exchanged one opiate for another. He became a Protestant. You don't sound like you admire your father very much. Admire? How can you admire a weak-kneed fool? He used religion to, to escape responsibility. He used God to prop that shaky ego of his. But if you deny the existence of God, you must also deny man's rights and dignity. Ugh, man's rights and dignity. Look, the sooner man faces the facts about himself, the better off he'll be. What facts, Mr. Marx? Well, the fact that man is a highly developed piece of protoplasm, an economic animal, nothing more. He has no soul. Therefore, as an individual, he means nothing. 
Uh, these are all bourgeois concepts that have no basis in reality. I can see why your ideas are called radical, Mr. Marx. They contradict the very basis of Christian civilization. Yes, they certainly do. When did you first formulate these ideas? At the University of Bonn. I had been reading Hegel, Feuerbach, Proudhon, and I saw the outlines of a new synthesis beginning to emerge. The blueprint for a heaven on earth. There was no time for anything else. I worked from nine in the morning until seven at night. At home, I stayed up far after midnight doing my writing. You see, communism demands a complete commitment and it consumes the entire man. Yes, I've uh, heard that said about communism. A moment ago, you spoke of a blueprint. Would you mind telling me more about that? Oh, it's, it's beautiful in its truth and clarity. Since man is an economic animal, he is essentially greedy. Now, the exploitation of the poor by the rich is inevitable. So is class conflict. And how, in your view, can that conflict uh, be resolved? Well, that's simple. Abolish private property and initiate collective ownership of all things. <laughs> then, when everything is owned in common, there can be no exploitation or destitution. How do these ideas of yours go over with your uh, associates at the university? Yeah. They were too bourgeois to understand them. They, they trumped up charges against me. <laughs> Nocturnal drunkenness and riot. I see. Uh, is that when you were um, uh, transferred to the University of Berlin? Yes. It was like the hand of fate. I fell in love. Well, from your remarks about total commitment, I uh, wouldn't think you'd find the time. The human, like any other animal, needs companionship. What kind of a girl was she, Mr. Marx? She was, she was a very attractive girl. Our marriage represented a triumph over the rules of class distinction established by the bourgeoisie. <laughs> you see, my friend, my wife was the daughter of a baron, <laughs> an aristocrat. In other words, you uh, killed two birds with one stone. <laughs> yes, you might say that. I remember writing her once, Jenny, if we can well, our souls together. Souls, Mr. Marx. I thought you rejected the existence of the soul. Well, poetic license. I was young. I was in love. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you. Yes. I was saying, if we marry, then with contempt, I shall fling my glove in the world's face and stride through the wreckage a creator. Where were you working when you got married, Mr. Marx? If you mean where was I being exploited, I wasn't. Well, if you didn't work, or in your words, get exploited, then how did you support I didn't. I starved, and I continued to starve, and I was proud of it. And uh, Mrs. Marx? Was she proud to starve, too? Yes. She became even more loyal to me. Didn't I read somewhere that uh, she was once quoted as saying that uh, if you had written less about capital and earned more of it, everyone would have been a lot happier? That is a rotten lie of the yellow capitalist press. Mr. Marx, there seems to be a contradiction here. On the one hand, you say you're going to reorganize the economy of the entire world. And on the other, you don't seem to be able to keep your own household out of bankruptcy or in food. I work for mankind, for the whole human race. I don't have to waste time on individuals. In other words, you... Uh, you love mankind, uh, but not man. Man is nothing. Humanity is all. For humanity, I want peace, love, and truth. Peace, love, and truth. Those words have a strange ring coming from you, Mr. Marx. They're almost a paraphrase of the Sermon on the Mount. No, oh, my words and meanings have no connection with the myth of the Bible and their innovating message. Be meek. If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn the left. Look, for the Christian, peace means servitude. And truth means, I, I tell you so, don't ask questions. And love is, is dedication wasted on a non-existent God. I, I have other definitions of peace, love, and truth. May I ask what they are? Of course. Peace is that state 
when the communist revolution is completed. When the classless society has been established and when all capitalistic influences have been destroyed. Now, now love is the subordination of one's own personal interests to the cause of world revolution. It is the complete commitment of one's whole self to the achievement of a communist society. And the truth? Truth is any act, statement or revision which furthers the cause of world revolution, of communism. And who decides that truth? I do. Just you? Yes. Uh, how would you describe yourself, Mr. Marx? I am the creator of a new man. Before me, there was nothing. After me... The deluge? Heaven on earth. And are we all created in your image and likeness, Mr. Marx? Animals starving in body and soul? Made only to know, love, and serve the communist state? Yes, 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 and it shall all come to pass. You will see. Now, 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 get out of here. I must continue my work. Karl Marx, the erratic German idealist, is the intellectual founder of world communism. His books, The Manifesto and Das Kapital, are the Bible of the new religion. Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev have all based their policies on his theories. The Europe in which Marx lived had moved far from its Christian heritage. Its universities were permeated with materialistic philosophies, and a large portion of the population had ceased to shape their lives by Christian principles. In England and Germany, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Marx watched in amazement as factories and mills began to fill the skyline. And he watched in horror as women and children were forced to tend the new machines for 10, 12, and 14 hours a day. Social progress did not keep pace with economic progress. Justice, destitution, and misery were rampant. Karl Marx recoiled at the abuses of 19th century capitalism. He recoiled at the hypocrisy of certain industrials who called themselves Christians. He recognized the problem posed by the Industrial Revolution but he failed to solve them. He failed because of his complete misunderstanding of human nature. He failed because of his sterile materialism. He failed because of his own twisted approach to life. Just how completely he failed can be seen from the words of our next guest, Nikolai Lenin, who formulated the worldwide communist strategy. Since my second stroke, I have worked harder than ever. It's the secret of my success, young man. History can be guided, events can be controlled, but only through complete dedication, total discipline. As a boy, I gave up all diversions in order to study. Fortunately, the capitalist world has never learned to deny itself. It has grown fat and soft with indulgence. That is why it is no match for us, why one day it must fall of its own dead weight. Was it really uh, dedication, Mr. Lennon, or deprivation? <laughs> a typical capitalist question. No understanding of human motivation. My father was nobility, a liberal and a humanitarian, but his generosity was dissipated by the decadence of the czars. Was that what caused you to become a revolutionary? Partly, but it was my older brother, Alexander, who was really responsible, he tried to kill the Tsar. An informer trapped poor Alex and his homemade bomb. He was hung. And all my mother could do was to cry out to her Martin Luther God. Oh, then you uh, come from a religious family. My parents were, not Alex and I. We saw religion for what it is a stumbling block in the path of history, impeding the progress of man. I wasn't trapped into letting it shape my life. But what would you say did shape your life uh, most importantly? First and foremost, the ideas of Karl Marx. Man is an economic, producing, consuming animal, nothing more. In that sense, each individual is determined his thoughts and actions are irrevocably shaped by his economic surroundings. But uh, what happens to man's power of free choice under that concept? Free choice. 
another one of those religious myths that we must purge from men's minds. Man can no more control his actions than water can flow up a mountain. Then the capitalist can prevent the consequences of their exploitation of the workers. What consequences are you speaking of, Mr. Lennon? The capitalists accumulate vast surpluses of goods through the sweat of the workers. But there is nobody to buy these goods because the proletariat have been kept penniless. The whole system breaks down. Communism steps in. The workers seize the means of production. The factories, the farms, the stores. Private property is abolished. All things are owned collectively. The dictatorship of the proletariat is established. Simple. You certainly make it seem so, Mr. Lennon. There is one question, though. If the uh, proletariat, that is all the people, are, as you say, in command, just how do they make their will known? We've thought of that through the Communist Party. And who uh, governs the Communist Party? The chairman, of course. I see. Uh, anyone else? No, he possesses absolute power. In other words, uh, under your system, all men are equal, but the, the leader of the Communist Party is more equal than the others. Well, it, it must be so. You see, the, the scientific concept of dictatorship means nothing more nor less than unrestricted power. Power unimpeded by laws or regulation and resting solely on force whenever the people must be convinced of what is best for them. Such as the five million Russian farmers, uh, according to your own official figures, that you let starve in 1921 and 22, was that uh, useful to the proletariat too? The success of socialism requires ruthlessness. It seems to me the cure is worse than the disease. You don't understand. Russia, to me, is a laboratory for testing communism on a grand scale so that one day it may be of benefit to all mankind. The welfare of the Russian people is secondary. Their sacrifices are inescapable and irrelevant. And, of course, I suppose uh, morality is irrelevant as well. You mean your morality? We repudiate and reject it. What is your morality worth when men are immoral? What real validity does it have? The whole point of our revolution is to correct the abuses of your morality, to tear away its concealing shroud, as well as the whole structure of capitalism with it. Only so can we establish a, a new order which recognizes the real truth of man's animal nature. If I may say so, Mr. Lennon, I, I find it difficult to reconcile your expressed concern for the people, uh, for their starving, with your admission that you yourself have killed and starved millions of the same people. It is not difficult at all to understand communist morality. It is entirely subordinated to the interest of the class struggle of the proletariat. Communist morality is that which serves to destroy the old exploiting society and create a new communist society throughout the world. In other words, for you, the end justifies the means. Precisely. The only important thing is the coordination of power here at home and the exporting of revolution abroad. The path of history cannot be altered. All roads lead to communism. Well, as you yourself emphasize, Mr. Lennon, all men are mortal. Now, uh, who will do the leading after you're gone? I have made arrangements for that. Yes, I've read the uh, political testament uh, you wrote in January 1923. You recommended the leadership be shared by uh, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, did you not? Yes. But you also said you didn't think such a partnership would work, and even recommended the removal of Joseph Stalin as Secretary of the Communist Party. Yes, I, I don't think that Stalin understands Marx's ideas, or mine. He is all animal, bestial, cunning, shrewd, more interested in 
power for his own good than for the people. From your excellent exposition, I think I understand your ideology and your strategy, Mr. Lennon. And it strikes me that Joseph Stalin would be an ideal leader for your communist cause. I'm tired. Very tired. I'll have to leave you now. The communists have many vices, but they do have one virtue. They are consistent. Their policies and tactics all flow from their fundamental philosophic premises, that there is no God, that man is nothing but a highly developed animal. Lenin reasoned in this way. If there is no God, then man cannot be made in the image and likeness of God. He has no inalienable rights, no special dignity, no unique value. He can be treated like the other animals, degraded or eliminated if necessary. If God does not exist, Lenin reasoned, then human freedom has no author and no real purpose. It can be violated at will. In drawing these conclusions, Lenin is being perfectly logical. Terror and tyranny, deceit and degradation are nothing but atheism in action. Atheism carried to its logical conclusion. If we recoil at the conclusions, we must also recoil at Lenin's atheistic premise, for the one necessarily leads to the other. Lenin formulated the grand design of communist strategy. His successor, Joseph Stalin, carried Marxist theories and Lenin's strategy into the daily lives of the Russian people. Mr. Stalin? Who are you? Who let you in here? Well, don't you remember? I arranged to interview you. Well, get out. I've changed my mind. But you agreed to have... Agreements are made to be broken. you come to undermine my position to smear me. I'm only trying to get your story, sir. All right. Go ahead. I faced worse than you. Are you uh, referring to the various uh, communist plots against you? Why limit it to the communist plots? It's the imperialist also, and the Trotskyites, and the priests. Oh, yes, the priests. I understand you once studied to be a priest. Oh, yes. They said to me, poor Joseph, Son of a drunken, starving peasant, come and I'll join our seminary. We will show you peace. How else was I to get an education? But your ideas were completely incompatible with those being taught in the seminary. Yes. Marx was intellectually fashionable at the time. I smuggled some of his works into the seminary, but I found it all very intellectual, too intellectual for me, in fact. I have never been much for abstract theories. I want action, results, and the sooner the better. Well, I suppose you finally found recognition when you joined the ranks of the party. Well, I should have, but I didn't. Lenin and Trotsky looked down on me. They considered me an uncouth fool, unfit to lead the revolution, suited only to carry out their orders. <laughs> well, that was a difficult position. How did you handle them? Well, what could I do? I played their game, I worked hard, I, I executed their policies, but I had my own objectives. I wanted power, unlimited power. It took me a long time to get it, but finally I succeeded. After Lenin died, I got it by eliminating all those who stood in my way. Were they uh, all your enemies? Now, some of them thought they were my friends, but they were all enemies of the party. Mr. Stalin, you have been called the greatest mass murderer in history. Do you refute that? Well, why should I? There was no other way. Well, do you have any idea of how many people you killed? Idea? I recorded it in my own handwriting. I eliminated most of the old line military leaders, shot for treason, 70% of my central committee, purified by death, hundreds of our diplomats. I want absolute power. How did the people themselves take all this? Were there no protests? Some. The primitive, religious peasants. They wanted to keep their icons and their own farms. How did you handle them? I ordered them into collective farms. When they refused, I took all their wheat and dumped it on the markets of Western Europe. That winter, they had no food. Seven million of them starved to death. 
was a good lesson for the whole country. But, Mrs. Talon, uh, why haven't the people rebelled against your terror tactics? Because of my tongue, my face. I destroyed their spiritual faith, gave them new icons. I put my face in every hamlet. I became the kindly father of all the Russians. In other words, with their spiritual faith gone, they were, well, they were forced to turn to you. You make it sound so easy. I was clever enough to utilize the doctrines of our great scientist, Pavlov. He said, if you degrade a man far enough, if you tire him, if you repeat a lie often enough, he will come to believe it. You mean uh, brainwashing? Guided control. Thought control. Discredit the fables of religion. Undermine spiritual faith. Suppress initiative and personal responsibility. Destroy the individual sense of his own dignity. You're willing to distort truth and uh, manipulate people just as long as it works. Even in the capitalist countries, the people act in accordance with our principles. They are concerned only with the gratification of their own bodies. And that's why they are so soft, why they are losing their power to resist. How many of them really believe in God? And if they do, how many of them shape their lives by that belief? In other words, uh, your tactics are irresistible. Exactly. Look at the world. What we can't win by lies, we take by force. One moment we threaten bombs, the next we send doves of peace. Hot, cold, cold, hot. Don't you think that free men will ever understand this and resist? No nation can resist our pattern of psychological destruction. They are doomed. Their God is dead. Their creeds have failed. History is on our side. In a very short time, all the world will be ours. The full vicious circle, from the distorted dream of Marx to the waking nightmare of Stalin and his successors. The communists claim to divinize mankind, but in practice they continually degrade him. They promise man freedom from capitalistic exploitation, but they subject him to the worst exploitation of the totalitarian state. They call class conflict a capitalistic creation but they abetted at every opportunity. They speak of the utopia to come, when all will be peace and prosperity. But in its name, they inflict inhuman sufferings upon hundreds of millions of human beings. In the name of the proletariat, they persecute the poor. In the name of mankind, they tyrannize men. In the name of democracy, they deny basic human rights. A tree can be judged by its fruits, and the fruits of communism our tyranny, terror, and human degradation. But what can we do about it? I think there's much we can do. We can refute the false communist creed not with words, for they can so easily be ignored, but with practice, with ideas and action, with lives permeated with our Christian democratic philosophy. The communists follow an inhuman morality of terror and exploitation. Let us meet their hatred with Christian love. Let us use our freedom to give all men in all parts of the world the respect due of being made in the image and likeness of God. The communists say there is no God. Let us prove them wrong by placing God at the very center of our lives. Let us so live that our lives would make no sense were there no God. And above all, let us use our freedom to rededicate ourselves to the God who made us and who said, I am the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <laughs> Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their God by serving those outside their church. <laughs>